No matter who you are or where you're from, we want you to experience God and experience friendship at Go Church. We hope you enjoy today's message. I have a quick query this morning, and I'm curious today, be honest with me please, how many of you know someone that does not like to wait? You know someone like this. Let me see a hand in the air. You know you're thinking of someone right now. How many of you, that person is sitting next to you right now? Hopefully not. Don't elbow too hard, okay? Not too many bruises on a Sunday morning here at Go Church. Now, how many of you, you would relate a little bit with me in saying that you don't like to wait yourself? You don't like to wait. Let me see a hand in the air. You don't like it. Come on, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Let's go. I don't like to wait. I'm not great at it. I'm not very good at it. I don't like it. Last Wednesday, I am picking up my boys, Ethan and Levi, from football practice at McAuliffe Middle School. So football practice was ending, the sun was going down, you know, it goes down now about like noon. So sun is going down, I find my kids in the darkness, I put them in the truck, and we are going from football practice to basketball practice. Okay, how many parents, you're already starting to empathize with this, right? Running your kids around, man, from one thing to another, one thing to another. So we have a very small window of time between football practice and basketball practice. And so I pick the boys up and they get in the truck. And of course, like every 12-year-old boy in the history of humanity, they are, guess what? Hungry. Like we're starving. Haven't eaten in like two days. I'm like, okay, we don't have a lot of time. We need something fast. Don't like to wait. Get it quick. What do you want to eat? They're like, okay, dad, dad, please. We want grilled cheese sandwich, extra cheese from Sonic. And I'm like, son, they don't even put cheese in that sandwich. I don't know what it is. It's like the cock gun of... I'm like, no problem. It's fast, it's quick, it's kind of on the way, we can do that. So I'm leaving McAuliffe, I'm on 26th Street, and I'm heading up the street, and I turn left on Monaco, but I cannot remember which street I need to turn right on. Cannot remember. I know it's coming up, I know it's pretty quick, and I know, because traffic here in Denver about 5.30, you know, is just lovely. It's lovely. Tail lights everywhere, right? It's slow. There's construction. Quebec is not great right now. Over there in the area of the Christian chicken place, Chick-fil-A, I think it's called. It's always, it's always busy. So I cannot mess this up because we're going to be late. And so I grab my phone and I cry out in desperation, Siri, find Sonic. She starts churning. And like the colors start moving, I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm starting to get frustrated. And finally, Siri comes on and she's like, I found a Sonic on Quebec Street. Is that the one that you're looking for? I'm like, no, I want the one 20 miles away. Yes, I want the one that is close on Quebec. Activate, go, start. And then she starts to spin again. It's spinning, the colors are moving. Siri's trying to find it. She's trying to work it out. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and I'm getting frustrated, and I'm running out of time. I know I have to turn soon. I don't know which one it is, so I just say, forget it. I'm like, Siri, forget you. I swipe up. I abort on Siri, and I went to the first place that I should have gone to is Google Maps. So I hit Google Maps, and it comes up. I type in Sonic. I hit start, to which it immediately responds, turn right. <laughs> Hang on, boys. <laughs> ah! So we whip it in right. We whip it in left. And yes, we whip it in for the grilled cheese win. Can I please have a light round of applause for getting food for my children, please? Light. Not too much. You know, as parents, sometimes you have to drive a little bit crazy, just a little bit. Always legal for those watching by internet. Always legal here at Go Church, but a little bit crazy. I don't like to wait. I don't like to wait on Siri. I don't like to wait on Google Maps. I don't like to wait in traffic. I have been serving and following Jesus for like well over 20 years. I've been married for 18 years. I've had kids for 15 years. I've had a dog for at least three years. You would think I'd be better at patience. I'm just not great at it. I am not great at waiting. I'm not good at waiting. And that's been an issue. And lots of things, but especially been an issue in my relationship with God. 
Because God does not always give you what you want when you want it, how you even want it. So there have been times in my life when I've had to wait on God, praying and waiting, praying and waiting. I've had to wait for direction. I've had to wait for clarity and a job. I've had to wait for kids to get out of diapers. I'm like, God, can you fast forward this, please? We had three kids in diapers at the same time. Same time. I'm telling you, I was like a pro at diapers. Twin, diaper changing. I should have had like two holsters, man. (laughs) Done. World record. Can we please, God, get through the season? Get through this. Get through that. Sometimes waiting on God has been difficult for me. Maybe you can relate to some of this. Maybe in your life there's been a season that you were like, God, can we please get through this? Maybe a season of hardship. God, can we accelerate this, please? Can you speed up my recovery? Can you get me through this financial time? Can you get me through this relational tension moment, please? Can you get me through the drive through Can you get me through the target line? Can you get me through the abomination that is Northfield Starbucks drive through line? A preview of purgatory right there in that line. But seriously, think about your life and the hard things that you've been through or maybe even the hard things that you're going through now. We're not naive here at Go Church. We don't think everything in life is always peaches and cream. We don't think if you serve God, if you serve Jesus, nothing ever bad happens to you or your life or your loved ones. Things happen. It happens because we live in a broken and chaotic world that's been damaged by sin and we still live in that blender, that train wreck, that car wreck of free will and chaos in and around our life. I do not think that God creates bad things and sends them our way. I think that's totally wrong. But I do think somehow God can use difficult times and use pain to somehow give us perspective. And I don't always like that. And you probably don't either. Last week, I threw a question out on Facebook and I said, what are some of the hard things that you're going through? And you could sense and see the tension. Some of these things were happening now. Some of these things happened, you could tell years ago, but some were fresh like right in the middle of trying to work through difficult, difficult things. And I wrote a few more down. I read a few last week, and I want to read a few today. This is from my thread. If we're not friends on Facebook, friend me. Many of you did last week. I rejected all of you. No, I'm kidding. I didn't. Friend me, and you can read these. I want to read just a couple of excerpts. Hard things that you've gone through or you're going through. First one, my father's addictions. Second one. My dad's attempted suicide and having to clean up the blood as a teenager. Still having a hard time trusting people. Third one. Asking my son to leave the house because of his drug addiction problem and his 12-year-old sister in the house. Next one. Caring for a friend until they died of brain cancer and now missing them horribly. Other things like infertility, betrayal, miscarriages, hard job loss. These are not made up. You know, these challenges come from real people, and some of these people are here today. I see you. And I want you to know today that no matter what you've been through, no matter what kind of pain you're experiencing today, maybe you identify with some of these Maybe there's been something that's happened to you or is happening to you that is as bad, as painful, maybe even worse. I want you to know that today you are in a place full of people that love you. You are in a place full of sojourners and people that have figured out a way to love God, to move forward in their faith, to move forward in their relationship with God in the midst of hardship not outside of hardship. You're in a safe place. You're in a place that believes that the size of God is bigger than the size of our problems. 
You're in a place that believes the sovereignty and the magnificence of God is much, much larger than any circumstance or problem or hardship, no matter how brutal it is. God is bigger and God is better and God is good. And we can figure this thing out together. We're here together as a family. We're here together as a team. And I want us to make some progress in this series called Hope in the Dark. We are exploring from the life of an Old Testament prophet named Habakkuk, how to deal with answers from God that you might not like. The first chapter of Habakkuk that we looked at last week, we started this series last week, and it's exploring the idea of can God be good? When life is not, it's not always good. Can he be good when life is not? Can there be an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-sovereign God, all-loving God? But sin and pain and chaos that we live in, can these two things exist at the same time? And I believe they can. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that we have every answer. We don't have every answer here. We have some. We have biblical truth. But we want to ask the right questions. Think about your life today. What's the hardest thing you're going through right now? I believe God today has something encouraging to share with you. Will you open your heart to hear it? I know that when you're going through pain, and when you're going through, from personal experience, a hardship time, sometimes any kind of encouragement that somebody tries to bring you feels like a scrape on an open wound because you feel like you don't understand. You don't get it. And it's hard to even receive encouragement or to receive love or to receive healing because you hurt so bad. I want you to know that God understands where you're at. And he's got something to say to you and to your situation and to your life today. I want you to take the communication card that you have and I want you to write this right across the top. Our one big thing today. And I feel like this thought encapsulates the book of Habakkuk quite well very challenging. I can't have God's promise without his process. I can't have God's promise without his process. Think about this. I think in our culture, in our life, we get enamored with the end result. You start watching TV and commercials, especially the new year, all manner of like workout videos, gym membership, super cheap, come get in shape, all the specials. It's easy in life to get in love with the end result. I want to be ripped up. I want to be jacked for the summertime. When I go to that Stapleton pool. <laughs> See, you already feeling convicted. All y'all right over here. <laughs> I want to get jacked for June. I want to get jacked for July. I want to get ripped, but I, I don't want to go work out. I mean, I've, I got stuff to do. I got some Netflix to watch. It's not easy getting up and getting extra popcorn. You want to get ripped up, you want to get lean, but you don't want to change your diet and eat those crazy things called vegetables. You don't want to do that. You want to get the new title, the new elevated title at work, but you don't really want to put in the extra work. You want to be the star player on the team, but you don't want to dig way, way deeper than you've ever dug before. You want to get recognition, but you don't want to put in the work. I think that's kind of how we are as human beings. It doesn't make us unique. It makes us kind of similar. It's easy for us to get a little impatient and a little lazy. And I think we can be the same way with God. We say, God, I want your promise, but I don't want your process. I want to be ripped up, but I don't want to work out and eat clean. The two just don't go together. So today I want you to dig and find a willingness to embrace God's process, even when you don't understand it, maybe especially when you don't understand it. Be willing to embrace it. The promise of God, the process of God, they go together. You can't have one without the other. The process, the process, the process. I've had to wait on some things in my life. When I was a sophomore at the University of Oklahoma, sophomore, I want you to get that part of the story. Not even halfway through, it was early on in my sophomore year, I felt like God called me into ministry full time. I just felt like God wanted me to be a pastor. But I was in the middle of my sophomore year. 
And I was not dropping out of school. I felt like God wanted me to finish school. So I had some years to go, right? So I finished school, felt this call in my heart. I even felt like God kind of impressed in my spirit and heart that I would come back one day and direct the ministry at the University of Oklahoma. So that was in me. That was one of those things that I felt like God told me what he wanted me to do. Sometimes God will tell you what to do, but it's the when that takes some working out. When, 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 when. Well, some years go by. So God puts this in my heart and a couple of years for school, Becky finally said yes and became my lovely wife, got married. We went into a ministry internship. We did some theological studies. We then moved down south to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We directed ministry there for at least five years. We got all this experience nationally, locally. We had all of our kids in Baton Rouge. It was 10 years to the semester that I felt like God said, you're going to be in ministry full time and I will bring you back to OU one day. It was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, a decade later that Becky and I walked back on campus as the directors of that ministry. Now, were those 10 years a waste? No, absolutely not. We grew so much in our marriage, in maturity. We had kids, so we got no sleep for a long time. Toughened us up. Missions trips, training, high level experience to take all of that back to the University of Oklahoma for six and seven years of ministry. It was not a waste of time. It was a part of the process. Open yourself up to God's process. Even if you feel like you have clarity on what God wants you to do, there might be some timing issues that you need to trust him with. And that can be hard. It was hard for Habakkuk. It was. It was hard for Habakkuk. Last week, we talked about chapter one. We're only going to do three weeks on this. This is the second week, talking about the second chapter of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, his name means to wrestle or to embrace. Everybody clear your throat and say Habakkuk. 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 Habakkuk, Old Testament prophet, normally prophets hear from God, communicate to the people. Habakkuk was saying, here's the condition of the people, and I'm going to tell God about it. Habakkuk was upset because the nation of Israel, they were sinning, they were breaking God's law, and he wanted God to rain down justice. That's what he wanted God to do. And then God answers that cry, and he says, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up your enemy, the Babylonians, and I'm going to use them to bring justice. I'm going to use them to help the nation of Israel understand that when you break the law, there are consequences. There is justice, but God was going to do it through the enemies of Habakkuk and Habakkuk did not like it. What do you do when God answers your prayer in a way that you do not like? Does that mean that God is evil? Does that mean that you've been praying the wrong prayers? I think it means simply it's just difficult. And that's the zone where you've got to develop some faith and some patience to plod forward in your relationship with Christ. So I want us to look at this verse from Habakkuk. Think about our one big thing. I can't have God's promise without his process. Look at the tension between those two things right here. This is Habakkuk talking to God. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. This is kind of the promise of God, the nature, character of God. God promises to be just. God promises to be holy. And so he's acknowledging that. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And then look, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? He's talking specifically, the wicked, about the Babylonians. He's saying, God, why would you bring them into this? I don't like your process. I know you're holy. I know that you are in control. I know that you are just, but I don't like how you're bringing your justice. I don't like your method. Habakkuk just wanted the destination. God, just bring your justice, leave the Babylonians out of it. I'm uncomfortable with it. I don't like it. It was not what he expected. I think it's a great Old Testament example of God doing something that you don't expect and having to dig a little bit deeper to find some faith, some patience, a willingness to wait, 
to see what God does next. This story, and really this line of thinking, it makes me consider the life of the Apostle Paul. We talked a lot about him in our last series. There's a moment with Paul that I find weird. There's weird stuff in the Bible. Have you ever read it? I mean, you read the Bible very long. There's some weird, odd things in the Bible. People walking on water, casting demons out of people. I mean, miracles. There's some odd, weird things. There's a moment with the Apostle Paul that I find weird. And I find weird because Paul had been used in so many powerful miracles. But when he started to suffer himself, God does something that's unexpected, and I find it odd. It's kind of surprising. So Paul, he has what the Bible describes as a thorn in his side. Not literally like a thorn in his side. as like a metaphor for pain. Some kind of sickness. We don't know exactly what the thorn in the side was. Bible theologians, they debate. You know, maybe it was a sickness. Maybe it was depression. Maybe it was some kind of spiritual attack. Nobody, nobody really knows. But we do know that it was bothering Paul like a lot. Paul prays to God, not once, not twice. Paul, the apostle Paul, prays three times, God, would you just take this pain out of my side? I mean, put yourself in this position, right? He's been shipwrecked a couple of times. He's been bitten by a poisonous snake and survived. He's raised somebody from the dead. God is using him for all these crazy miracles. He's planting these churches. He's writing these letters that turn into the Bible later on. Paul is being used in powerful ways. He's been imprisoned because of his faith in Christ. He'd been beaten because of his faith in Christ. He'd been stoned because of his faith in Christ. And that man is praying one, two, three times. You would think if anybody was going to pray and get a hold of God. If there was anybody that God was going to heal, it would be Paul. Paul's crying out, God, heal me. And God says, no, no, Mm -mm. no. I find that weird. God says, no. And instead, God says this to Paul. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. You don't need physical healing. You need a better perspective of my grace, and I'm going to use this pain to help build your perspective. Again, I don't think God creates pain to use it against us, to teach us lessons. I don't think that's the heart of God. I think it's bad theology. But I do think that God can use pain that's happening in our life to help us understand him and ourselves and our loved ones a little bit better. Because my grace is sufficient for you. Paul goes on to write. He's like, he rebounds in the moment. He's like, okay, well, God wants me to understand grace. So Paul almost turns it around and he says, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to boast in my weakness. I'm going to brag about it. I'm going to brag about my need for God. I'm going to take glory in the fact that I am weak. And in the middle of my weakness, God's strength is made strong. God talks about how his power is going to grow in the middle of Paul's weakness. And it begins to change Paul's perspective. So I challenge you today, like I've been challenging myself all this week. Are there things that we have been praying for? Things that we've been focusing on? Maybe we need to shift our focus away from the pain and shift that focus to our provider. Instead of just trying to get out from underneath the thumb of pain, God, help us to elevate our perspective. Help us to raise our eyes. Help us to take glory in the need of power from our Savior. It's so easy in our culture and in our life to want and to crave and to desire the mountaintop experience. Maybe you've done some 14ers. Maybe you've done Everest. Maybe you've done things in between. Maybe you've had these high points where it's like, this is the moment. I've only done a few 14ers. I've done them with friends. I've done them with family. And they've been good. The thing that I remember the most about doing a 14er or hiking is not really the top. It's the journey. And it's coming back down. Sometimes it's a little harder than you think it's going to be. So many times in life, we get fixated on the mountaintop on the promise, on the destination, on the end result. And we just want to live there. I would push back on that a little bit and say, look, does the mountaintop experience change us? I don't really think so. I think the process changes us. 
It is the straining and the fighting and the digging deep and the pushing past the pain and even encouraging others on the journey. That is what changes you. And the great thing about God is that he is with us through the process and on the mountaintop and on the other side as we walk back down into life. We're going to have these times in life, up and down and up and down and up and down. How are we supposed to respond to the hardships of life when you hurt, when your nerve is exposed and it's getting scraped on by life? How should you respond? I want us to look into the Bible to see how Habakkuk responds. He does three things, and I want to give you three things today to be challenged by. Normally, when we have one big action, I'm going to hit you with three today. So get ready to write. Grab your communication card, write this down. I will, I will watch. Remember lifting your eyes up from earlier. Habakkuk 2.1. I will climb up. This is Habakkuk talking to God, responding to God from this challenge of God using the enemies. He's trying to dig deep. He's trying to find faith. This is Habakkuk. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post, there I will wait to see what the Lord says. There I will wait to see see what the Lord says. I like this imagery. I don't think he was literally crawling up on the watchtower at the guard post, maybe. I think this is kind of a metaphor. He's saying, I'm going to elevate my eyes to the Lord. And I will challenge you to do the same thing. When you hurt, the first thing you should do is watch. Watch for God in the middle of your pain. Watch for God's faithfulness in the middle of your despair. It's the idea of, yes, seeing your circumstances. You're not naive. You're not dumb. You see the circumstances. But a discipline to elevate your eyesight up and say, yes, I'm still seeing that in my peripheral vision, but I'm lifting my eyes up to God. God, I believe you in the middle of this tough circumstance. I believe you're going to come through. I believe you're going to show up. I believe that you are telling the truth. I love this idea of watching, watching in faith. So I'm challenging you today in the middle of your hardest situation that's happening right now. Are you fixating on those circumstances or are you lifting your eyes to your creator? Acknowledging the circumstance, but looking for the creator. You can do both. I think Habakkuk does both. I will watch. The second one is this. I love this. I, I will write. Then the Lord replied, obviously the Lord telling Habakkuk to do this, write down. Everybody say, write down. Everybody say, write down. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. And I want to encourage you to start doing this in your own life. And I'm going to lead by example here. So this is one of my journals. And I pulled it off the shelf and I was thinking about our journey and our history. And I started to go through this and I wanted to show you a couple of entries talking about writing it down. I want to encourage you to start writing down your prayers, writing down your pain, write it down. God, I am struggling with this. God, I am worried about that. God, I'm asking you to show up in this way. Write it down, write it down, write it down, write it down. So when Becky and I were thinking about moving to Stapleton from Oklahoma, this is the first post. I had visited one time and I put this first little post over here in Northfield Starbucks. I was sitting there and their drive through was still slow then. <laughs> it was. Uh, so this is just me sketching and thinking and wondering, God, please provide. Our, this is not Arabic. This is my handwriting, just to let you know over here. And God, please provide. God, please direct us. God, help me know where to live and start Go Church. We didn't really know. We were praying about it. We were trying to figure it out. And I sketched this little house here, and I included all of our family, and prophetically included our dog. We did not have a dog at that time. That is not to scale, okay? That is not 164th to an inch. We wrote this down. I wrote this down, and it started our journey of seeking God. God, help us. Are we supposed to move here? Are we supposed to do this? So I go back home. We feel like it's the Lord. We get our stuff together. We're going to move out of our four-bedroom house in Norman, Oklahoma, by the University of Oklahoma. Four-bedroom, all brick, front yard, backyard, three-car garage. (laughs) And our mortgage payment, I think, was like 1,200 bucks. It was not in the 1860s either. It was only like five years ago. So we are trying to come out here and we find an apartment. 
we needed an apartment that was either ground floor or if it was up, we needed an elevator for Sydney. And so that gave us like one option. And so the option was like $1,600, I think. Let's go to the next one. So we finally say we're all in. So I'll write this down. This is May, look at that. 2014. We are renting an apartment in Stapleton, Crescent Flat, $1,600 a month, 1,300 square feet. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> and I think the last part may have been because we were going from a four bedroom house to two bedroom apartment, all of our kids, one room. Bunk bed. I, saw, I heard a gasp. They were like, oh, God, no. Yes, help me, Jesus. So we write this down, look at the next one. So we're here a little while, we're trying to get housing figured out, are we gonna buy a house, you know, to be the most expensive house we've ever bought. And so this is in the middle of that context. It's right here, it's one, two, three. I'm a little intimidated by that huge number, something like 22 to $2,500 a month for a house. Becky is going to teach, couldn't do it without her on any level, not just financially, I'm telling you. God, I pray that you would open up and make clear the housing option you want for us. Write it down, write it down, write it down, write it down. I go back, let's go to the next one. And I fill this in. July, 2015, it was about a year after that post. Wonderland home, Dorado Ranch style, 2,700 square feet, awesome. $417,000, smiley face. I don't know why I was smiling about it. <laughs> That's when you know you've been here too long. It's like, what a deal. We can eat three days a week now. <laughs> God, thank you for answering prayer. When you write it down, it gives you the ability to go back and to fill it in. If you go through my journal, you will see entries and entries, and then you will see things added in later. God did this. God did that. God was faithful. God provided the house. You read about Sydney getting sick and going through struggles and, and seeing God be faithful and God use people. I want to encourage you like Habakkuk, right? it down in your life. The third thing that he did that I want to challenge you with is this. Wait. And this is ouch. This is hard. I started by confessing this is hard for me and it might be hard for you, but that doesn't mean that it's not the Lord. It probably means it is the Lord. I found that the harder it is, the more godly it is. Look what Habakkuk does. Two, three, and four. But these things I plan, this is God talking to Habakkuk, but these things I plan won't happen right away. And our human nature is like, oh, this is not like two-day shipping. It's going to take a little bit. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient, they will not be overdue a single day. I'm telling you, when it's not God's timing, you can't make it happen. And when it is God's timing, you can't stop it. God has a what, he also has a when. And today I want you to remember and to be encouraged in this fact. We are sitting and standing in the middle of a promise of God. 2014, we did not know each other. 2015, we did not know each other. Some of you guys, 2017, we didn't know each other. God started something. He put something in our heart, the what, five years ago. It took one, two, three, four, five years to get here, to be able to stand here together in the presence of God and say, look what God has done. You're standing and sitting in the middle of a promise of God, but it took a process of moving and believing. It took a process of some of you saying, I'm going to be part of something crazy called a launch team and to be a part of this team that's gonna do something that's never been done here like this before. I'm gonna be a part of that team. It took money, it took prayer, it took sweat. It took hardship, it took challenge to get us to where we are today. It took joy, it took celebration, it took good, and it took challenging times. I want to encourage you today, Go Church. We are not at the beginning of the end. It's just the end of the beginning. Yes, I'm excited about what God has done, 
but I believe the best is yet to come. You look outside of these walls, you look through these windows, you walk through these doors, and I want you to start imagining as you leave today, what if God started touching and ministering and reaching that house and that house and that house and that house? I want you to start thinking about your courtyard and your neighbors. What if Jesus and the gospel got all up in their family, in their kids' lives, in their marriage, in their work, and you start thinking about God moving and growing and using Go Church to do it? God is big. He can do it. Do you believe Leave that go church. Imagine living like this, figuring out a way to carve out some patience, a willingness to wait. I wish I could get up here and say, it's easy. I'm perfect. Look at my example. I am not perfect. It is not easy, but you can do it. We can do it together. We can't do it alone, but we can do it together because God is good and God is faithful. I want us to pray. God, I pray right now for every person in this place, every hurt, every exposed nerve. God, every bit of that list that I read today that is real, that's happening right now, God, the the needs that we don't know of. God, I pray right now in this place that you would help us to trust you like never before. Help us to be willing, to be willing, God, to watch, to lift our eyes up, beyond the circumstance to you as a creator, to lift our eyes beyond the problem to you as the provider. God, help us to watch. Help us to write so that we can go back and fill in your answers, your deliverance, your provision. God, help us to wait. When it's time to wait, help us to wait. When it's time to move, help us to move. Help us to have the wisdom to know the difference. God, help us to have strength to do it when we need to do it. God, help us as sojourners, as friends, as family, to trust you, to move forward with you. Maybe you're here today and you have never trusted God with your life. You've never trusted God with the totality of who you are. You might have known some things about Jesus in your head. Maybe you've been to church a bunch. Maybe you've been to every Sunday here at Go Church, but you have never really totally trusted Jesus with your life. I believe today is the day for you. One of the stories that Jesus told that I love so much is the story of the prodigal son. It was the idea of the son taking all the inheritance and the money that his dad gave him and going out. And he lived his life and he wasted it all, crazy living. And he hit the bottom of the barrel. He hit rock, rock bottom, middle of a pigsty. He comes to his senses and he says, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to go back to my father. Maybe he'll take me back as a servant. He won't take me back as a son but maybe he'll take me back as a worker. He gets his stuff together and he starts his trip home. And Jesus paints this picture of the father waiting. Waiting. I imagine this father out on the porch every day, maybe in the morning, maybe in the evening, just looking for that horizon to be broken by a silhouette of a son. Waiting day after day after day after day after day, maybe season after season after season. And then one day, as the father was waiting, he sees a silhouette break that horizon line. And he recognizes a silhouette to be not a servant, but his son. And the father leaves the porch and he runs unabashedly towards his son. And I believe embracing him and pulling him in. We talked about waiting today. The Father has been waiting in eternity for you in this moment right now. For some of you, it is your time right now to take that one step towards the Father as he is running towards you. This is how you embrace the Father. This is how you know him, by accepting his one and only son, Jesus. Jesus came and he gave his perfect life on a brutal cross He took upon himself the punishment and the sin of the whole world. Took it upon himself. He paid all of our bills. He paid it with his life. They pulled him off of the tree and they put him in a tomb, but the tomb could not hold him. He was there for three days. And on the third day, God raised him miraculously back to life. And he is alive and he has a plan for your life. And that plan is relationship. Do you know him? Today is your day to start. If you're here today and you want to give Jesus Christ your life, you want to make him the Lord and the leader of your life, I want you to pray this out loud. In fact, let's just all pray it out loud. Pray this out loud with me right now. Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. 
I ask that you would forgive me of every sin. I am making you the Lord and the leader of my life. And I'm going to live for you the rest of my days. Now, if you're here between me, you and the Lord, you prayed that prayer, you meant it. Would you put a hand in the air and say, that's me, Pastor Nick. I'm coming home today. I'm running to my father. Yeah, hold him up. Hold him up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I see you in the back. I'm so proud of you guys. Come on, can we put our hands together and thank God for what he's doing? Come on, thank God. Get happy for what he's doing.